Now it is my great pleasure to introduce someone who will give us a broader perspective on the difference that women make. Milan Verveer is Executive Director of the Georgetown Institute for Women, Peace, and Security. I first learned about Milan when she was First Lady Hillary Clinton's Chief of Staff. Together, they co-founded Vital Voices Global Partnership. Some of you have participated in that. Some of you know about it. It's a non-governmental organization that trains and empowers emerging women leaders all around the globe. Vital Voices correlated women's empowerment with global peace and prosperity. And I wondered, why did no one think of this before? It's up to the women, said Eleanor Roosevelt decades earlier. Four years ago, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton appointed Milan as the first UM, US ambassador, global US ambassador for women's issues. She coordinated foreign policy and government and private sector. She worked a lot with women in this room. Uh, initiatives to spur women's entrepreneurship, increased education, health care, to combat gender violence, which is so critical, that work and to fully integrate women's rights with human rights in U.S. foreign policy. Why didn't anyone think of this before? It's up to the women. And what a woman, brilliant, gracious, indefatigable, and committed to women's integral role in global prosperity and security. This is Ambassador Verveer. And yes, she also has a life. She and her husband have three grown children and two grandchildren. And today she's going to share her global view of what she calls the gender dividend, women's economic and political leadership. Please join me in welcoming the wonderful Ambassador Verveer. Now, as you've heard already, uh, I recently left the State Department where I was privileged uh, to serve as the first ever U.S. Ambassador for Global Women's Issues. The Obama administration has made empowering women a cornerstone of our foreign policy because we know that no country can get ahead if it leaves half of its people, its women and girls, behind. We also know that if we're going to tackle the great challenges that confront us all around the globe, whether they have to do with security, with economics, with governance, with the environment, and so much more, we cannot do that unless women are participating at all levels of society. Otherwise, global progress and global prosperity will have its own glass ceiling. So I want to talk to you today about political and economic power, the political and economic power of women. And I want to do this in a spirit of realistic optimism. You've already heard mention of the World Economic Forum, as, and I'm sure that many of you know that it annually publishes a gender gap report. And in that report, the WEF looks at the gap between men and women in a given country on four metrics, health and survivability, education, economic participation, and political empowerment. Now, why do they do this? Clearly not because they're a women's organization. They do this because in countries where that gap is closer to being closed, and in no country is it closed, but where that gap is closer to being closed, those countries are far more economically competitive and far more prosperous. The other thing we know as one looks at the release of this study over several years now is the gap on education, in education and in health is closing. Women are catching up, if you will. But in terms of economic participation, 
there is still significant progress to be made. And in terms of political empowerment, it is the toughest of all. But as tough as it is, Women's political participation has improving, has been improving ever so slightly. But in the last 10 years, the rate of participation in national parliaments, for example, hovers around 20%, and more and more countries are reaching that critical mass of 30%. Currently, there are fewer than 20 heads of state or government uh, who are females, but among them is the President of Brazil, the Chancellor of West Germany, the Prime Minister of Australia, the President of Liberia, the first ever woman on the continent, now joined by another, the President of Malawi, and the most recently elected was the President of South Korea. And women were on the front lines of the Arab Spring. In Egypt, Tunisia, and Libya, they stood shoulder to shoulder with men in hopes of ushering in dignity, self-determination, and a better life. Tawakal Karman was named the Nobel Peace Laureate with two other women two years ago. She is from Yemen, and she told me what happened in her country in these words. She said, women woke up, and they are not about to go back to sleep. The act of participation has irreversibly changed the role of women in these societies. And today, as they are struggling for equal rights in the constitutions that are being written, and they are struggling against violence against women, which is a global scourge. They are also finding, however, that their own rights are being jeopardized, and no one knows what the future will hold. Despite all of this, the reality is that women are half the population, yet hold only one-fifth of the positions in national governments. Women are still outnumbered in most bodies, including in negotiations where armed conflicts are being resolved. In other words, the decisions that affect women, their families, their societies, are being made, for the most part, without their voice, without their talents, experiences, the perspectives that women could bring to bear on public policy, where so many important decisions get made. And I've seen firsthand what happens when women are empowered politically. Thanks to a quota that was adopted many years ago in India, today there are over a million women in that very local level of politics, at the village level and the municipal level. And they are doing remarkable things when everyone snickered and said they won't make a difference and their husbands will basically function in these positions. Today, they are called the silent revolution in India's democracy. And they are running in large numbers of seats that are no longer reserved positions. They have begun to make that kind of difference. And what the studies show is that they are providing effective leadership. They are using public resources wisely. They are investing in sanitation, investing in education, investing in the things their communities need. And to be with any of them, even for a short period of time as I have been, is to see that resoluteness that Betty talked about, that I can do it, Ness, if you will, uh, that enables them to keep going despite the challenges that they confront uh, and despite the risks they often encounter. Now, why should any of us care about all of this? Well, for one, a democracy 
without women's participation is a contradiction in terms. The World Bank studies also show that women, as they are able to get into positions of higher leadership, particularly in democracies, as that happens, as they go up, corruption goes down. I also remember several years ago when I was working with women from Kuwait who did not have the right to vote nor hold office. They were struggling, and only recently did they finally achieve their goal. But what woman, woman told me has always stayed with me. She said, you know, we're tired of a skim milk democracy. It's time for a full cream democracy. And that will only happen if women are part of it. Advancing women is also important to global security. Yet women are largely shut out of peace negotiations and shaping post-conflict decisions that are going to tell us a lot about whether a country is going to transition from conflict to stability. More than all, half of all peace agreements in the last five years, I'm sorry, more than, all, more than half of all peace agreements fail in the first five years. Over a decade ago, the United Nations Security Council adopted a resolution linking women to peace and security, recognizing that women have a key role to play at all levels of, of this resolution because they suffer unspeakable violence in times of conflict, and as many of you know, rape today is being used as a tactic. One need only look at what's happening in Syria or look at the DRC. In many ways, in some places, it's more dangerous to be a woman than it is to be a soldier. So in December of 2011, President Obama launched the first ever National Action Plan for women, peace, and security for the United States. We are Johnny-come-latelys in some way. Many other countries have advanced this and, and adopted their own plans over the last many years, including NATO. But the United States now is committed in a way that we have both an executive order from the president and a roadmap, if you will, that we are called to accelerate efforts uh, to advance women's participation across government uh, in our diplomatic work, in our development work, and in our military efforts as well. And this affects all of our policies, whether they have to do with Afghanistan or Sudan or Colombia or the political transformations that are occurring in Northern Africa and the Middle East. This action plan focuses on a few areas. One is women and conflict prevention. Women are like canaries in the mines. The denial of their rights and the subjugation of them is closely linked to the instability of countries. And we need to pay attention to what's happening because these are warning signs of far worse that can come. Secondly, women in peace negotiations, from Northern Ireland to Liberia and so many places and in between, women have contributed to a durable peace. They put issues on the table that or ordinarily would not get there. Human rights, jobs, citizen security, accountability, and so much more. And we can see as a result how this contributes to the peace lasting instead of peace treaties being abrogated over short periods of time. Yet only 8% of peace treaties over the last 20 years have included women's participation. So if life is to improve after a conflict has ended, these very issues are a critical part of the resolution.
Surely it is that. It is also one of the best investments that can be made for peace, for prosperity, and for progress, something we all want to see. I hope that each of you will continue to champion women's political and economic leadership as you manifest it in your own lives, both at home and around the world. This is what I intend to continue to do in my next chapter, and I look forward to working with all of you. I believe we are on this journey together. And remember always, it is the right thing to do. It is also the smart thing to do. And we cannot settle for anything less. Thank you.